Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, <clears throat> Christopher Tarnowski, and I'm with FlyLogic Engineering, and glad to see a, a big turnout for the last uh, track of the day. Um, so this track is going to basically consist of a very deep analysis of an older microcontroller from Infineon. Um, at Black Hat, we decided we'd do the Infineon 44 series used in uh, some smart cards from Silink. Have you, anybody ever heard of Silink Data Security? No? Link encryptors, things like this, trust your data with them on your laptop, um, so forth. Um, who uses smart cards here? Anybody? Awesome. Um, you guys probably use much newer ones. The problem with the newer ones is the principles you're going to hear today all apply to to tomorrow as well. But you'll you have newer challenges as everything starts to shrink. The average smart card today is about 180 nanometers. What we'll play on this afternoon, this evening, is going to be about 1,000 nanometers. The average smart card today is getting meshed now with active meshing to keep this type of stuff from getting. Uh, direct access to the bus lines or the memory outputs, things like this. Um, I'd like to go through a quick, quick overview of what I talked about at Black Hat um, and then get as much time as possible probing with you guys. And we'll actually sit on the bus with this chip, we'll eavesdrop it, and I'll, I'll explain some points because some of you will probably be thinking, well, we run encrypted busing, encrypted address fe you know, fetching, um, scrambling, who knows what. And honestly, it's, 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 that's good, but th these principles apply to everything because there's always a way, another way to skin a cat. Um, who uses the 6805 or the 8051? Excellent. Now, do you guys know uh, Assembler? Most excellent. You guys count clock cycles? Good, because we're going to count some clock cycles. Um, so this chip is, is again, it's pretty old, um, but it, the, if you can grasp what, what we're going to talk about, you can do it to anything if you get to, you know, but you've got some challenges obviously ahead of you. Um, so, momentary fault, what is it? Basically, it's, it's, it's opening up the chip to get to the substrate and temporarily changing the behavior of, 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 of this state machine that's running, because that's really what a microcontroller is. It's a complex state machine um, with uh, specific behaviors and dynamic behaviors. So the change is always going to be precisely calculated. It's, it's, it's guaranteed as soon as you do your homework and do your calculations of where to apply it. Um, most of the time, the fault lasts no more than a few, a few clock cycles. I, I had wanted to do a demonstration with a stack overflow. However, uh, it took a little much, too much time given the probe setup the way it is. So I'm going to show you basically a destruction of a loop that reads bytes out of the E square of the, of the chip. Um, normally we'll get 10, uh, 16 out and with one glitch with a needle, I'll make it spill 256. Um, and I could keep repeating this loop uh, as well. Um, th this particular glitch is going to last one clock cycle period inside the core of the of the uh, 44 series Infineon part. Sometimes, though, I may hold the fault forever. Maybe I want to, you know, freeze the instruction latches and make the code, make, make the chip latch um, a two-byte fetched instruction of some kind with like a, uh, an instruction and an operand. Um, something like this is very, very favorable to a hacker, and most of the smart cards today still don't have any defenses against this. The only, well, I, I take that back. They have defenses, the meshing, the size, and such. But once someone overcomes these, there's no defenses, you know, for, for allowing me to, to read out all of memory, mess with the MMU, change the memory mapping if it's over 64K, things like this. So there's always going to be challenges, but what you're going to see today is it applies to it. It's just you may need to think a little bit outside the box to get it to work. Just for the slide up, I should have asked you guys, uh, you want to sit on the bus. Does anybody eat, uh, do reverse engineering here? Okay. What, uh, I mean, substrate reverse engineering with microscopes, needles, and things? Anybody? Okay. This chip, any chip is no different than, than, than a PCB if you lay out PCBs. Anybody do, do PCB board design, things like this? Okay, excellent. So the only difference is instead of doing a scan on a PCB, on like a scanner to look at the tracks if you're trying to trace out wires or using a, an ohmmeter, um, you need to use a microscope. 
And um, to touch these wires, they're much weaker than we are on the outside world. We need to use like a very low capacitance uh, buffer um, or an op amp, for example, something uh, something very light so the wire doesn't sink down and, and the slew rates don't get destroyed um, for the transition between a zero to a one and one to a zero. The driver needs to be capable, in, in our, for our purposes of this talk, um, an op amp won't work because an op amp is only going to take the signal out, amplify it, and bring it to you. Um, that's, that's just listening. We're not going to just listen. We're going to listen, and then we're going to momentarily induce a fault that we've chosen at what point in time to do it. So we, we're, we know their clock counts. We know where they are at what precise point in time, and we're going to physically change the value on the bus at that moment. The driver needs to be low capacitance, needs to be capable of driving a one or a zero because this way it gives you the flexibility. If it's a one, you can make it a zero. If it's a zero, you can make it a one. If it's 180 nan nanometer technology or smaller, maybe and you know maybe the voltage you can't make a one. Let's say uh, it's too you you don't have a driver that supports like 1.65 volts. Maybe maybe you find then an instruction that you want to instead drive to a zero because it's very easy to force a line to ground uh, through, through, through a driver that's running at 2. Point, you know, 5 volts or 3.3 .3 volts or 5 volts even, just as long as you don't drive 5 or 3.3 or, you know, .3 or whatever into it. Um, so these chips are getting smaller, getting lower voltage. There's you know, new challenges, but all of these techniques today will apply to anything tomorrow. So why do we do it? Why do we do it? We do it because maybe we want to overwrite the stack pointer make this loop, as you'll see soon, uh, repeat as many times as we'd like. I've only prepared it to do it once. Um, it's not really useful to do it more than once because the high side of the data pointer is not getting um, incremented, so we're stuck in a page of 256 anyway. Um, but maybe this is not a microcontroller because this is not just smart cards. This is also any type of, of silicon device that you've got, any digital circuit we can apply these techniques to. Um, maybe it's a cryptographic ASIC of some kind and you want to falsify a, a MAC or an HMAC or, or a cryptogram of, of some type. This is, technique can apply again. It just takes a little bit of uh, effort and, on your part, on the attacker's part. So to put the fault into the chip, we're going to need to physically touch the substrate. So we've got to open it up with some acids. None of this is being dis uh, discussed today. You can see the video on Wired. Has anybody seen the video on Wired? Okay. I was very tired, but um, good. I'm trying to... Good, good. Um, did you understand most of what you saw? Good. Even better. Good. So you take that and you... Again, apply it to today. There's some new challenges, but it's still... It's the principle of what I did in that video that it... With a little bit of thought, you can do it. Infineon 66, 88s have a mesh, 220 nanometer technology, five metal layers with the mesh. So use a fib, bridge the in to the out, and then use my wet chemical techniques and blow a hole right through it and get right down to the core of the, uh, of the 66P. Um, okay. So this is a Thompson 19 series processor. Don't remember which one, but something I took a long time ago and it's, it's very interesting. So you can see the yellow, the yellow track is the data bus of D0. The, the blue line is a trigger, some trigger that I had. The green line is the clock. And again, just going back to these, this chip versus that chip, this chip happened to run on an internal clock. So this green clock you see actually had to get plucked out of the CPU uh, with a needle. So this was many needles, uh, I think five needles on the substrate. And, but for, for this point and purpose, um, we care about D, D0 and the fact that we're in, we're in uh, sync with uh, their internal clock. The purple line is reset. So this is literally like five or six instructions on the D0 bus, bus line. D0 is the LSB of the instruction fetch on the, or the data bus. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's also the bit that flips the most. And, you know, you make a 0, 1, 1, 0, um, change 24 to 25. Uh, you know, anything. Um, in Motorola, like 21, 20, 20 21, 22, 23, they're all the complements of each other. Um, in 8051, it's a little harder because it's like 20 or 30, uh, jump if not bit, jump if bit. But you move the needle to that, to, uh, to bit four instead then. I prefer to use D0, though, as much as possible. So you can see here, we're just listening. There, I've, my blue line is some type of a trigger point. Tr it's probably the trigger point that tells the driver to fire. Fire meaning I've already prepared my higher low level glitch. And, um, so I've, I've set that side of the 126 that I'm using uh, in, to be, to, you know, cock the gun, you know, cock the chamber. And um, that trigger is basically the trigger. 
So here in the next picture, we changed it. We physically induced a zero when it should have been a one. And so you can see, I changed the entire instruction processing afterwards. Now we're only sitting on D0, so we can clearly see that what came afterwards is, uh, is, is some of our other fetches, and some of them, the one was on high a lot of periods, and then down low, and on high again. The instruction cycle period here is, is um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty quick. It's like 10 or 12 megahertz for a smart card. Anyway, so this is the theory. This is the whole theory. Before we do a glitch, you don't just randomly throw, you know, you don't put a needle on the bus and just start jamming it down to ground or jamming it high and stuff. You're just going to go nowhere. Um, so the first thing to do is for us to take what's called, what I call the running code. So it means that we basically put a needle on D0, we come out of reset, so we, we, turn, on, we turn on VCC, we, we have the reset line low, we just start the clock, and then we release reset, and we just basically, we take, we take say, 32 uh, kilobits of samples. Uh, on D0, then we save it in our in, in the software, and then we move the needle to D1, and then we do D1, and we can put down two or three needles if we want, and do them in batches of two or four, or etc. Um, it's quicker for me to use one needle and walk the bus, so to speak, to do this running log than it is to to manipulate two each time. Um, how many needles do you think it takes to dump one of these smart cards? You guys think it takes a SEM to dump one of these smart cards? Do, do you get, anybody know what's this, a, scan, a SEM is? Scanning an electron beam microscope. Does anybody use a SEM or do SEM prepping? It's a pain in the butt. Um, and I, I don't use a SEM. I don't even use a FIB for half the chips out there today. And you'll hear all these rumors that a FIB and a SEM and a university level is needed. It's never been needed, and it's only now needed since, say, 2002-ish, when they started to get below 350 nanometers. Um, Anything above 350 is typically only three metals. It's really easy to get to metal three or two. If it's below 350, typically it's going to be a four metal layer. It could even go up to five, and plus a mesh maybe. The microchip, uh, the, micro, the Microsoft licensing device, 8-pin SOIC, and every one of your wired or wireless controllers used on an Xbox 360, it's got a little Infineon chip inside. Infineon's so paranoid that you're going to get to their logic underneath that they laid a double, uh, triple mesh. So they got two active meshes with a ground plane in the middle. Infineon kept that practice and took it to the SLE 88. Does anybody use the 88 series SLE? No? 32-bit risk from an Infineon? 66, single mesh, very easy. Um, so we're going to study running code on this chip. None of these principles about meshing and things apply. The chip's very opened up. We're, we're going to look at the code, see where it went, and we're going to pick an instruction that we want to change. And the instruction is going to give us something that we want it to do and not what it should have done, um, such as keeping a, a loop that fetches a byte and transmits the byte to the outside world. Keep it going. So if a DJ and Z is one, what happens? It's, it loops one more time. But when that goes to zero, it's decrement jump if not zero. Your jump stops and you fall through to the next uh, code, you know, piece of code. So what if when it goes to execute that instruction, I change, in this instance here, that one being read out to go into the ALU to decrement it, because that's exactly what happens in, in, in this 8051. It, it, you see the program counter low on the bus. You see the opcode fetch. You then see on the DJNZ of R or whatever, you'll see the value come out of the register into the ALU. You'll see it get decremented and stored back again. So if it comes out with a one and I hold it to zero, it, it goes in as a zero. It underflows, becomes FF, FF's 255. We get 255 more bytes back from the loop. So be very careful when you do like move X at A at the data pointer, increment data pointer, you know, that type of thing in a loop. Um, we don't always play with the data bus, although we will today. Um, the data bus could be encrypted, it, it could be in the clear. It, it honestly it doesn't matter. You can kind of tell what's going on with behaviors of, of uh, CPUs typically, unless there's some wacky, zany, crazy, you know, no one knows the instructions of a CPU. 8051's 0 to 255 uh, possibility for what the instruction really was that got fetched, if you are encrypting it. Uh, 6805, same boat. AVRs, things like this, are a little wider of an instruction. It changes the rules, but again, these principles apply in, in theory. Address bus, though, can change 
you know, location zero, I can make you go to location one instead. You don't know, but whatever came out is going to be, you know, is going to be used by whatever is being done at that behavior in, at that state of time. Address bus faults, typically, I'm only going to play with them on a cryptographic memory type uh, devices, uh, Atmo Crypto Memory, Dallas OneWire type parts, things like this. Things where I don't really have control. I can read out public areas of memory, but I can't read out private areas where you hide your key material or secrets, seeds, things like this. So it knows if it gets to 80 that it, it needs to, it throws a mux, and you can't read out that data. So it sends you zeros or FFs. Depends who's, who, who, who does it, you know. Everybody's got their own way to do things. So what if we sell it to read zero, but I force bit seven high on the address bus? What's that become? I just ordered something into the bus. It becomes 80. So let's say 80 is protected, but I gave you address zero to read from. So I told the chips logic with the firewall area of the chip is saying, oh, it's zero, it's okay, let it go. But I'm oaring in bit seven later on behind, behind the address bus drivers. Well, behind, behind logic where it can backfeed. Um, and it works beautifully. So zero becomes 80, one becomes 81, and so forth. Um, does anybody have any questions? If you do, stand up, please, and just ask. Um, I want this to be very interactive, and I want you guys to come up on stage and put a needle down, too. Um, anybody want to play with the needle? Okay, cool, cool. Excellent. Anybody have questions yet right now? Am I going too fast? Because I'm trying to cram this in. Uh, you, sir. Absolutely. Two needles, two up. Uh, five needles is easy too. Um, you start to go above five needles, it starts to get really hard. Um, the more needles people that I talk to that don't really appear, to, you know, that maybe are telling little lies and stuff, they typically tend to exaggerate the needle count on how many it would take to extract the code from a processor or something. But if I can make behavior repeat, if I can make a fault repeat, I can maybe do do it in two needles, but with this technique, I can do it in one needle. Um, let's say you're doing software, and you know you may say, "Oh, well, we do software randomizations, or we do hardware ran randomization." You know, so you're randomizing things in hardware, like the cores, randomizing things with dummy bus cycles and stuff. That's fine. Then I'll put down another needle, and I'll eavesdrop the internal latches of where the instructions coming in. And now the only time the, that I would need to clock in data is when those latches open and close. But I would miss some of the bytes too. I would miss operands because the latches will not open and close on there. Um, so you generally, honestly, one to two needles, I'm done. Two needles, I'll do it quick. One needle, I'll build a script. I, let, let me rephrase this. With two needles, I can not care about what's in the code, and I can simply freeze, up, freeze an instruction in the code and basically walk the bus and read out memory in most cases. Or I can let something run, freeze it, and then let something else run, this type of thing. Maybe skip over signature check. Um, I, you could do anything by freezing uh, instruction latches. But it's also very beneficial for a 64K memory map to do a readout. Like on uh, the older 6805s from Thompson, Motorola, this, uh, this stuff. The newer stuff has MMUs, a memory management unit. So you have more than 64K of physical memory. So you've got to kind of let, let the processor work for you. And then when you get that page mapped into memory, then do your attack. Things like this. But two needles, one needle, you pretty much uh, you're, you're good. Does that, does that answer your question, sir? OK. Yes, sir? Somebody uh, had a question over here? Yes. We'll go there in about five minutes. So you mean structure-wise, how do I know what I'm looking at? Um, yeah, we'll go there in a, in a few minutes. And I think it's, that's kind of something you kind of learn with experience if, if you've got the time to play. Um, but you can pretty much tell who laid it out once you've, as you open up devices, because maybe they won't mark Infineon on, on a smart card, although they do typically, um, or ST, they, they do. The cell library is going to look just like it does on the off-the-shelf off stuff of that feature size, of that geometry. Um, you know, and like for example, today Intel's down at 45 nanometers. That's pretty small. Um, but I don't need to probe the lot, the actual logic. I need to get to the wires, um, and that's where we're going to go there in one minute. Uh, anybody else have any questions before we continue? Yes. 
specific ranges of addresses. Let's say you're dealing with a well-documented microcontroller that has a debug port that you know works, but is only meant to be to read out RAM variables, but you know that if you ask for an address or ROM, it will give it to you, but you haven't been able to successfully get a consistent dump. What's the chip? It's a, um, it's a Super H chip. Hitachi or yeah, Renaissance. Um, I'd go. I, I'd, I'd have to see it and read the spec. Read, the spec's going to tell you a lot. I mean, they. they Well, I'll give you a good example. This badge has a 9S08 on the back of it. Anybody use the 9S08? Nobody. Anybody use the motor, the Freescale Motorola? I call it Motorola still. Um, the, the Motorola Freescale 908s, like the JB12 things like this. The 908 was more secure than the 9S08, and the 9S08 got shrunk. It's a, it's a TSMC process. It's a 250 nanometer four metal layer. And the irony here is they tried to make you believe that it's super, super secure now. So they tell you if the last address in memory has to be um, a complemented like a one zero combination on two bits, on like bit zero and one. And, and they tell you, so when we do, when you do a bulky, the only way to clear this is through a bulky race, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's great, but what if I tell it to bulky race? Oh, and then, wait, one second. And then they warn you, once you bulky race it, you need to make sure that you set those bits back to one zero because they become FF, all ones. You need to set those bits back to one zero before the next reset. So what's that tell you? That tells you that in logic, they tried to, they just execute a bulk erase, and then they then in their conf in these actual bits that would normally load that address and store that, am I locked or not? They clear those for you. So what if I cut the VPP line? Does anybody know what happens if I cut the VPP line and then tell it to bulk erase? It doesn't do anything except clear those two bits, and then I read your chip out. So. I mean, just food for thought, there's a lot of ways to get into these backdoor monitors and, and such that run, and a lot of these chips are being fabbed by TSMC, like free, uh, uh, Freescale, I'm trying to think here who else. <laughs> um, I see it a lot, you see it a lot though, there's a data, databiz.wiz or something out of like Irvine, they're making a smart card, it's got like 10K of statogram on it, 32-bit ALU, 16-bit opcode pitch. It's a TSMC, same exact memory model. Once I learn the memory model on the off-the-shelf freescale parts, I can just buy their smart cards at 10 bucks a piece and I can whack them. You know, I know exactly where data bus outputs are, clocks, address uh, structure. Um, be careful. Databus faults are all we're going to focus on today, and it's it's the most probable choice. It's very easy to spot the databus, and this is what your question was about before. Uh, it's got to come out of the memory, and it may come out of the memory encrypted, but that doesn't mean that you can't understand. At least you can understand when it loops, because if it's encrypted, if a if a if a if a twenty, let's say it's a twenty twenty fe, it's the wrong chip, but that's a sixty eight hundred five branch to yourself. So let's say it's an 80 FE, a short jump to yourself in 8051, either of those two. Let's say they're encrypted and they're coming out as, you know, uh, 1055, who knows. You're going to see on the bus, you're going to see 1055, 1055. You're going to see this come out constantly. So you know that, you don't know really what it is, but you can tell it's a branch to itself and it's sitting there forever in an endless loop. So you just figured out two instructions from that address point of how, what they decoded to. But you may not even need to know that. You can see encrypted code running in loops. Let's say I know a 66 is uh, non-ISO reset. Does anybody know what non-ISO reset is, is, is in an Infineon 66, 44? It's when you hold the IO line low and you release it out of reset and that for about 400 clock cycles, and then you release it back to a pulled up state, to a one. It then identifies you its chip lot and things like this. This is what we're going to exploit today. Um, if it's encrypted code, I can see the loop where I can see encrypted code that says basically, you know, do a fetch from wherever the data pointer points, transmit the byte, and I'm gonna, and then you can see, the, you know, decrement whichever register it is, go back up and do it again if it's not done. You can see it. You just don't understand it, but you can make heads and tails out of it quickly if you if you're focused enough. So be careful if you run encrypted data buses, and these techniques are still going to apply. Um, anyway, cryptographic, we can make key spills, as I explained before. Um, execution steps, same thing. Determine when to, in, in fault, uh, to induce it. Um, we may want to repeat the fault. We can if we want to. Just you need to precisely time things. I want to get to more of log traces that I've done and take some with you guys at this time and show you code, some code snippets from this Cypress chip, which is uh, like defunct over 10 years old, and show you what I see on the bus and show you where we're going to do our attack, and then we'll demo, 
you can basically watch exactly what I'll do, but in my lab it's much quicker because this is uh, the wrong uh, equipment, but this is something you guys could build yourself too. This was built purely for, uh, for like a show and tell. Uh, otherwise the probe station is over 300 pounds. Okay. So I mean, technology, it's improving and it's getting good, it gets great. And, it, and the whole theory here is how much money is it going to take, how long is it going to take the person to, to do it, to be successful, and then will they get the reward back? And that's really what you need to focus on. And I think a lot of these companies are on the right track to do it, but there's still a lot of room for improvement and there always will be. Um, everything, every smart card to date that's ever been made by these manufacturers, except possibly the 88 series of Infineon, has been broken if it's by pirates, if it's been used in a, an area where they can sell counterfeit things. And it's not just like conditional access for television. It could be uh, satellite radio, for example. XM satellite radio, they're using a Thomson 19. I don't know why they're using it. It's not secure. Um, Scientific Atlanta, they're hiding a Thomson 16 and 19 in their set-top box. Why? It's, it's, up, it's, up, it's obscurity, and obscurity is not security. It's, in, it's a layer. Um, if it's made by human, it could be taken apart by human. So... I'm going to get out of this, and I'm going to try to kind of work with you here a little more dynamically and, and interactively. So this is, does anybody like like ROM bits and things like this? You heard people talking about doping ROMs to read them back out. That's probably the most useful technique of today. And the reason for that is because most likely if you're not encrypting the address, you're scrambling it, they're scrambling it, and it, gets, and it needs to be decoded. So that means not only do you have to, do you have to study, the, the, um, put the bits all back together the way they went, and you may make a mistake optically, you need to understand the address decoding logic as well. It's a lot of work and effort, and this, the method we're about to get into is, much, is a lot easier. But if you did want to study the ROM, you could play around like this. This is the, uh, the actual instruction dispatcher table of this 44 that we're going to play with. This is a f uh, 500, pow um, 500 magnification view of, of the ROM stripped down to its poly diffusion area. And so now you can, you can kind of see I didn't finish this. And you guys are welcome to all these pictures and such. Um, I just didn't want to post them on a, the, a public link. But if anybody would like them, I'll have business cards at the end or the pres my emails on the presentation. Email me and just ask for it, and I'll give you a link off my server. And you can download the whole archive. It's going to be about 800 megabytes. Yes. How did you get this? Is this a photograph through a microscope? Yeah, this is a photograph through an optical microscope, uh, Zeiss Axiotron 2 with confocal scanning. Um, it's a 500, it's a 50 50x subjective with a 10x mag, so it's basically a 500x magnification of the area. Again, this is a 1,000 nanometer process. It's very pretty big. I mean, anything under 130, I need UV. I need to use ultraviolet um, to with camera, and and I have to make mosaics to to study the logic. But again, the wires I can see them. I just can't see the actual gate structures. But you can make out based off of the way things come into metal one what the circuit might be doing, and then if you can put a needle on it, you can figure you can just deduce the behavior immediately. Um, so you can see here I drew little lines. It's a 36 across. This is common 44, Infineon 44 series um, instruction dispatch table. It's a, it's a 256 by 9, you know, 256 elements with 9 bits across if you want to look at it as a table. It's in bit form though, it's 36 across and 64 down. So you can see that right from here to here there's 32 plus 4 more and that gives you 36. And then each one of these rows, there's 64 rows. So this has been chemically wet etched uh, with buffered hydrofluoric acid before this image could be seen like this. I then took a dark field uh, reflected light image of the area. It's four or five images. It's well, four or six images, excuse me, uh, tiles stitched together as one. And basically, you can see everywhere. I mean, I didn't finish, but if you guys wanted to play with this in Photoshop like I started, anywhere you see right here, for example, that would I would put a dot there, put a dot there. Wherever the, the blue and the red lines cross, if there's, um, if you see the glasses connected, the poly or the, right here, uh, put a dot there. And then it's either, then, then you can walk every, so this would be a, this, this would be a bit, this would be a bit, this would be a bit, and so forth. Every first one for, let's say, address zero. It may not be decoded that way, though, but that's just a hypothetical example. And then you may have it backwards. The, the dot may be a one or it may be a zero. It all depends on the, on the remainder of the logic, how they've laid it. But we're not going to go any deeper, but you can have the pictures. All right. So we're going to go into this chip. It's 
It's got a mathematical coprocessor in it. Again, it's, got, it's doing RSA internally. Uh, R, does anybody know what RSA is, the graphical algorithm? Okay. Um, I don't think it's any larger than a 512-bit RSA type um, mathematical um, setup. However, you can see it. You can tell this is a crypto block. It's, it's isolated by itself. It's actually been like an extension to, the, to, this, to this chip. They took their normal 44C80 and they added this, this math block to it. And it's basically a ton of RAM and some shift registers and, and you know, demodular multiply, whatever you need to do, square. Um, but this is really where we care about. We don't, we don't care about this area. So just we'll forget about this area and we'll go right into here. Does anybody know what this area is right here? This is the non-volatile non -volatile double EEPROM. Um, it's only 8K, and it's a pretty large element. Um, your static RAM is going to be your smallest uh, size element, but largest area consumed for the amount of cells that they're giving you. So you've got some static RAM here. You've got ROM here, I believe 32K, and you've got 8K of EEPROM. So you know that there's a busing, there's busing structures that are going to tie into here. Then we can see there's some type of a, of a ROM here and some type of a ROM here. Here's uh, the ground, here's the I.O. line, here's you know, VCC, reset, and clock. ISO 7816, Every, most of you guys know what this is? Do I have to explain it? Half duplex, smart card, uh, after reset, sends out, answer to reset, tells you what, about itself. Um, okay. So this is a 5X mosaic, a 50, 50X mag. It's too small for us to try to look. We can't see anything. We're looking, we see like there's some busing structures. We see the static RAM is right here. It's connecting, we can count the lines. I mean, this is a thousand nanometers, so a 50X mag is, is good for a general blow up of what, what are we look, what are we, what are our goals, what are our challenges, what do we see to kind of plan your attack. We see some lines coming out, we see some lines here coming up. They kind of meet in the middle area. So something's telling me that this is going to be a pretty good area to kind of sit on and sit in. We know that the 8051 has a, has a multiplex data bus, so we know that the low address of things is going to be, are going to be present on it, and static RAM is connected to it, as well as the E-square and, and the ROM. There is no MMU because we know it's within 64K of a physical, of a virtual memory map. Um, so we take this. We, we, we already located where we want to be. We want to look in here. We're very curious. So we image it at a higher mag in that area only. This is about, this is two rows of 10, e, ten each. So this is not just two pictures here. Um, ironically, the older chips do not look as pretty as the newer ones do. The newer ones have a lot of different colors in them and stuff. So we look at this and we start to see some bits, uh, some these lines that we saw at, at the 50X mag, at the 500X mag, now we can see we can see a little bit better where their vias are, how they're plugged down, things like this. So we see one, two, three. Hey, look at that. This one's plugged into that same track, and it goes up towards that static RAM. So we're on the right sheet of music, or we're heading in the direction. Then we got another one here. There's another plug, another one, another one, another one, and it, and it keeps going. So this looks like it could be a good candidate to be the data bus of this chip. It is the day of us, the chip, to cut to the chase. <laughs> so <we're, laughs> um, it's pretty easy to find the date of us a lot of times because you know the RAM is connected to it. That's, that's the moral of the story here. Um, and it's not the case in all, in all smart cards and such because they try to isolate things nowadays and throw them through muxes, what area of memory are you in, things like this. But you can always go to the edge of, of the ROM because you know the chip powers up out, out of its ROM. So you know it's running right there. And the data bus drivers are always pretty, pretty straightforward of what they'll look like. You can see here that there, there's... Actually, you can't see here because I didn't go enough. But you can see down here, if I zoom in more, you can see this is repetitive logic here. Does anybody have, a, have any idea? Anybody do logic that has an idea what these are? What do you think they are? Yeah, they're latches. They're the instruction latches. So there's two ways we could suck the code out of this chip. We could induce a bunch of faults. We could study the behavior of the running code, which we'll do, and we could then like look at what was happening on this bus, and we can change the instructions as they're happening to force an overflow of the stack, possibly. It takes a long time. It takes me maybe a whole morning to do this, to get this Trojan to work. But when I'm done, I just put a single needle down and press a key, and, the key, and it executes like clockwork on any of these. And so that's the easy way. That's the hard way to do it, but the payoff is, the, the reward is, is, is tenfold when I'm done. Yes? No, that's a very good question, actually, and I didn't even talk about that in the intro. The point is to do maybe, maybe, maybe you want to know the RSA key of this chip. Maybe you know how RSA works. You know that 
you send in whatever, it, and it processes it with, it with its secret key, and it returns a result. Maybe you want to make a clone of this card, or well, I don't know why you'd want to do it, but if you're in if you're in like satellite TV pirate, you'd want to make a physical change to this to turn on all the services, for example. Or maybe um, maybe it's a crypto memory, and you can't. You can't write unless you know the secret. So you have to sign something to get it in. Things like this is, is why you'd wanna you'd wanna get the code out or make a change to it. I'm just, I'm just, I don't understand. Like, I understand like, what you can do with that if you got the code out, but like how does an actual stack overflow get you the code? Oh, you do. Well, you need to do it. So basically you need to look and see how Okay, I'm sorry. He's asking like how do you make a Stack Overflow work? And it's no different than the, if you guys write in a, you know, if you guys are Windows hackers or something, or you know, these guys writing these Windows exploits. It's the same theory. Um, you basically write further into memory than you should be allowed to, because we changed the instruction to make it continue in its loop, receiving data and storing it indirectly. So an indirect pointer basically is writing in memory. The Stack has to reside in a memory somewhere. It would be nice if it was in its own private area, such as a PIC microcontroller has its uh, stack privatized, but in most cases it doesn't. It's, it's right there as well. Um, so but we find some locations in memory that, that are of use. We already have seen a lot by looking at the running code. We're, so we can pick addresses to jump to off the stack. So we're basically gonna, just going to reload the stack, adjust any type of loop pointers to make it stop, and hope it hits a return soon to, to execute the, the sequences that we've pushed into place, kind of. But these pushes should never have happened. They're happening because we we'd executed this physical glitch with a needle. Or, you know... Um, If it's a 6805, beautiful, beautiful, uh, yes. So he's asking about executing RAM uh, code from RAM. That's even better on the 6805. Um, you can, you can instead load your worm into the RAM and then tell the stack now jump to jump to 100 or wherever your RAM, your code went, and you know where it's getting stored because you've already looked analyzed the running code of the chip. Um, The goal, or, or yeah, the goal is either the goal is to get the secrets out, get the key material out, or maybe do a permanent modification to the chip to where now you have free write access to it. Most of these chips do not let you write to the E square anything useful. Um, so it, the only way you're going to do it is to, to kind of invasively or, or through uh, voltage glitching. You might have heard of unloopers, things like this. Um, make it skip an instruction, or in our case, modify an instruction to to, to abuse something and do it. Um, once it's done, though, you you have complete control. Okay, um, so we're going to look at some logs, actual logs taken uh, today. I'll show you a couple logs, actually. There's too many chips to get into. I try. I wanted to get into the 66 on a Gem Plus. Does anybody here work for Gem Plus? <laughs> really? You're going to love me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, I have like some 6805 Gem Plus cards here, and from the IBM smart card secure way is anybody does anybody use this to secure their laptops or files and stuff no okay um, how about uh, gem safe does anybody use gem safe has anybody ever seen this little orange card they're on eBay actually both of these cards are on eBay for like pennies and that's where these came from you just buy 100 200 of them for pennies and then you can do all your R&D to hack them that you want to um, leapfrog does anybody ever has that, they ever heard of leapfrog they made they went out of business um, this is again, a, this is the same processor as this without the crypto. Okay. Um, GSM, SIM card? Anybody? Clone your GSM SIM card? It's exactly why we're here. Um, except today they use a lot of Atmel AVRs and such, um, and Infineon 66Ps, things that are hard to get to. But they did use easier chips eight years ago. I mean, I've had A3A8 or A3, A, yeah, A, you know, the, the pre-comp 128, whatever, dash one algorithm out for six, seven years now because they put it in an 8051, they put it in the 6805, they put it in chips that were never really that secure that got, you know, CC certified, common criteria certified, FIPS, uh, whatever the FIPS is, 180 or 140 certified, um, and so forth. So here we go. I'm looking for the better log. I have a commented log more than that one. Uh, 
Okay. So basically, what, the, what you're about to see is basically the dumped code that came out, some snippets, so we can kind of line up, so, just so you can understand that what we're seeing on the needle with the needles is actually, it, it, it's the same as what you'd write in assembler. It's just, you kind of have to, you don't see the, it, it, clock one, clock two, clock three. You have to kind of parse it apart. And I do this by manually by hand, typically. Although I do have tools to automate it. Um, so... Uh, bear with me one second. So this is the dump of activity from Apple Plus? Yeah, this is actually, I, I, I want to show it to you, but I'm just looking, I have one, I'm trying to find it, that's, that's do heavily documented on a lot of the instructions to kind of show you. Otherwise, it's kind of the, really the lowest level that you can get inside of here. Um, unless you really want to start tearing the poly apart and you know and see the gates and, and everything, and that's something. I mean, I, I do it. I, I do it. Karsten Knoll does it a lot. There's a lot of people. Bunny Wang. We all do it. But this is much easier than starting to tear apart logic and decode it and put things back together. Okay, I think. Okay, this is fine. This will work perfect. Okay, so this is a log I made a while back. Um, so the chip powers up. The, the manual barely even tells you what clock cycle it really starts running at. This particular chip takes a while to fire up. They, they clear uh, FF to down to F8 in RAM to a zero. And so you can see it here. You see on clock cycle zero, clock cycle one. Um, so this is basically what period of time the processor was on when I took the sample. But I didn't just take the sample once. I had to repeat this eight times. So I put one needle down and walked across the bus eight times. Just let the code run. If you've got randomizers, I'll see it because all of a sudden the, no, the code that looks normal will go to, will, will become garbage basically. And so uh, th I'll just look in front of what, what, what happened before that went to garbage and I'll just whack that and stop it. That'll be glitch one. Um, you know, so no, I'm, ser I'm very serious. A lot, I see a lot of chips with like e an E square is a, has a, a seed value that then seeds software randomization. And it's great. You guys should be randomizing things and trying to take time between the ATR first button and the second byte coming out and things like this. You've got to get the first byte out fast and then they, they so they send it out fast and then they try and um, randomly uh, change the delay between the second byte and the first and that first byte. And I mean, I guess it's good, but there's other, you know, it's, there's other things that they should be worried about. Um, but everything, t you can never not do enough. That's really, don't forget that. So we sit here, boom, finally at clock 3F hex, this chip fires up. Can everybody see this? I don't know. Let me see if I can zoom in. Oh, um, is that better? Okay, I have no idea what it does. It's like a function icon on my laptop. Okay, so, but it, it works, uh, you know. Okay, so at clock 3F, we've got a zero on the bus. Guess what? It's the program counter, the low side of the program counter. Remember, I told you the 8051 is a multiplex uh, data bus. It means you're going to see, it, it makes it take more time, too, because that's a wasted clock cycle right there. So you wonder why that move of an immediate value into a register on this 8051 took, I believe, 10 clock cycles. It's because three of them were address, address, uh, uh, sets of the low of the low side so with PCL gets set to a zero boom all of a sudden a 75 is sitting on the bus on the next clock cycle sample and then again there's a 75 on the clock cycle next uh, clock cycle sample and then we see a PCL of one come onto the bus and then we see the, the operand then we see a two then we see the operand and here's the end this would be the end so this is the complete this is exactly what's on the bus of, a, of an Infineon 44 series 8051 during a move, uh, a, a move, a move, a move an immediate value of 80 into register D8, which I have no idea what it does because I don't have the data sheet. Does anybody have any questions now? Okay, are you guys bored? <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> I'll go all night. <laughs> but, but we got to put some needles down too, so don't forget. <laughs> okay, so then boom, here we go with a, a program counter low of three, and it just continues and continues. So I, I'm flowing the code on every clock cycle. I see what's going on. I mean, now we can go, let me shrink this. Let me shrink this. And let's put these two next to each other. And I run Linux, by the way, as well. I, I got some, there were some comments online that, oh, he's Windows. Yeah, most of my tools are Windows. It's so easy. But I, my server's Linux, so, you know. <laughs> Quad core, eight ways on. It's good. Um, so here we got, um, we, we've got that same listing. I'm just trying to get synchronized here. So 
now it's too small. Is it too small for you guys, or can you see it? Okay, so originally on this chip, I had, I had sat on the bus and read it, and then I just decided it was taking too much time, so I, I tried the instruction latch approach. That worked, but I was missing, the, for some reason, this particular chip gave me some trouble with this. It doesn't always work like you'd hope it would. Um, and so I went back to the, in, uh, the invasive single needle glitches. And the problem with that is the time, as I said. And the nice thing about this was I realized that Infineon on Power Up all of a sudden has this like take some bytes from the outside world and stuff them into memory indirectly and you know decrement uh, register and loop. Well, it's beautiful because the stack is at seven or eight still wherever it powers up to and the loop should be like 10 bytes and we just get, we whack the R3 and we can overwrite the whole stack, load our program in and go, and go wherever we want. But to load the program in, we needed to first do a lot of running logs, maybe send a uh, five byte ISO header into it, see what it wants. Can we overwrite the stack through the ISO header? We probably can. In most cases they loop that too or they loop some of the bytes coming out of the HDR to, to if you want to read out the entire memory space or e square, let's say. Um, so we see here, here's the initial power up code. We see um, there's that move of a D into D8 that 10, this is the clock count right here. This is the line of code it was on. These are the oper uh, the, the whatever number of uh, oper you know, of instruction and operands are, are present. Um, a clear A takes three clock cycles. It's an E3. Where is it? There it is right there. So boom, program counter low comes out, E4 instruct or, uh, E4 instruction, it clears their accumulator, what's next? Um, and it just continues and continues and continues. And so basically, there is some strange behavior that nobody would know unless you're at this level. And this is something that we were examining earlier when we wrote the script that you'll see get executed. And things like uh, uh, R1 touches of increments, it, it starts it and then it finishes it during the next instructions dispatch. It's just the weirdest behavior. But I mean, they can do it as long as they get both things done sequentially. Um, so if we go back to this line of code, we see that there's this like thing in power up right here. It says jump. And, and by the way, guys, this code is pretty much static across any 44 series. If I show you it from the 66, it's going to be static in the P or the S with some, ver some variety to it sometimes. But pretty much all the S's would be the same and all the, P all the P's would be the same. All the 44 series are the same. Um, every Infineon 4466 is going to do this thing that we're going to abuse. So if the I.O. line is high, execute the, the person's, the ROM code that you wrote in or the, the, the designers wrote. But if it's low, they go into this, uh, this, what I call CMS hello, which is like the hello of the Infineon part, give you a lot number, things like this. It's very cool though. They start the data pointer at 8,000 and then they uh, read out 10 bytes or, or it could be 11 bytes. It depends on, the, on which series. This is for practical, um, for our hands-on. It's not really a loop that's easily abused because the high side of the data pointer is not getting incremented. So we're stuck in the page of 256 of where they set it. And if you look up above, they had set it to, eight, to 80. So because they set this to 80, we're only going to be able to glitch and get out 8,000 to 8,000 FF in, in, um, in, in the memory map. But it's E square. And there's a lot of secrets a lot of times in these people's codes up in the front. And then they put all, all of, the, uh, of their code later in, in time. Um, I was just going to get into that. So with a little more effort, I can start playing around and I can start, yeah, exactly, make it 81, make it 82, make it 83, but it's a pain. It really is. There, so I would find a better loop if I really wanted to do this. And there is a better loop because the stack pointer abuse is in here too. Um, so, but for today, quick demo. Uh, I, had, I did it on the machine in my room this afternoon. Um, we're going to basically bring it into this area. And notice it says move in a 10 into R2. So that means it basically R2 is going to become their counter and it's going to think it's going to send out 16 uh, bytes of the EEPROM to us. Well, it's going to send out 256 when we're done. So um, there's a little delay here. They pull a value from, uh, from E square. So this is a special instruction from these guys and we'll abuse it. But notice only R1 gets incremented. So since R1 is the only thing getting incremented, um, it's not going to get us too far. But maybe there is something we do need, like a secret backdoor key, or, or, or maybe the only key that you need is in the clear right there at that point of memory, or it's encrypted but you know how to decrypt it, things like this. Um, so hypothetically, this will be fun. Um, when it's done, it does some things, we don't care about this. It's going to end up freezing because the chip is not in Infineon's test mode any longer. If we did want to read it out, we wouldn't have come here. We would have followed this jump, 
to 45 right here, we'd let all this stuff, we'd do it, we'd actually, we would glitch this, or we would glitch this. To the, it's a check that they do, because Infineon claims that you can never get back into test mode. They're liars, but they're nice ones. Because, I mean, you really normally can't get back in, but I can get back in, um, you know. So, <laughs> so we make, we can change the address of this fetch, or we can change the data fetch from the address. There's a bunch of ways to skin the cat, but I prefer to keep the line, to keep one needle only down and never move it. So it's much easier. If you don't have a laser cutter, you don't want to be moving, trying to open up two different tracks. And so here you can open the track with like a sewing needle and a 45 degree angle kind of stab the silicon and you can pop the glass off the top. This will work for you, but down to about 350 nanometers um, if the wires are spaced apart. If they're, if they're too close together, you'll probably short two wires together, two tracks. Um, and it may still run though, so you may still be okay. Okay, so we're going to glitch this if we wanted to overwrite that stack we were talking about before. We'd continue, there's an, um, we're, we're, we, we would be changing the behavior so it, instead of going towards normal power up, it goes towards getting back into their test mode. It's behavior they're trying desperately to keep us out of. So this is just one check of several checks that you'd have to get through. Um, you, they'd, we'd have to change this one, then we have to change this A call. If, if this A call, comes out the way it the way it's written, uh, it'll freeze on this next instruction. So, yes. What's the four byte password? I don't remember. <laughs> it's, oh, the four byte. I know the, the four byte password is something they set in memory. It needs to be like um, it's a four byte Infineon password that says, "Yeah, you're in test mode still." Type thing. And when you're done, it's an OTP value. I think it's 99. It's like. It's actually the A9 is one of the bytes, if I remember correctly, and the 33 shouldn't be 33 yet. Uh, so those two are, are two of them. Um, but when they're done, the, the 8,000 byte becomes the 33. They took away some some of the other bits, and the A9, I believe, they destroy that to something else, and then they write the lock code in on all the good stuff. Um, so the, it's a four byte password, but we destroy the, that A call, and that's. See, so what am I saying here? I'm saying 51A4. So, oh, do you see what I did? So this used to be 51B5. So, I, so, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. This is here. I destroyed this A call with, with it. So instead of being A5, I make it A4 by, by grounding out the, uh, the, the bit zero of that fetch. So we've, end, we've done some glitches to get past like this four byte password and things like this. And now we're, we'll do a glitch here to make sure that this jump if not carry uh, is, 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 uh, goes in a good way and not a bad way or it's going to freeze us right there. But again, if it freezes us right there, we could do something to change that too. It's just probably not going to sit on D0 anymore. They've got um, some weird thing here. I thought it was maybe an erase, bulk erase, because you're trying to get back into their, east, their test mode of the, so they, sometimes they try to bulk erase memories, but it's not. I have no idea what it does. Um, they do some silly things that we don't care about, and then they call this, this routine at C5. And this I've never seen in any of the other 44s that I worked on that were, more, that were used by my old employer. Um, but on the commercial ones in GSM, uh, this, the, the, um, the leapfrog card, the silent card, every commercial over the shelf 88, um, sorry, 44 otherwise has this in it, and I don't know why. So when I'm done building the script over at the stack, it'll work on pretty much all of these popular 44 public chips. Um, so C5 says receive a byte, store it in wherever R1's pointing, increment the pointer, decrement R3, if it's not zero, continue fetching bytes. One squash of that R3 and we can overwrite the stack and we're done. It's, I mean, if you've got to prepare everything and make sure it's the right stacking of the, um, what, you know, whatever you're going to do um, and, and it, it will work fine. So today, um, who, how many people want to put a needle, a needle actually down? Do you want to see me walk the bus and build? I can. Uh, um, do, should I walk the bus? I, I mean, I want your input here. Should I walk the bus and build this script like you see here, similar to that in front of you, so you can see exactly how it's being built? And you can see how if, it, if I had things wrong and the data bus was, wasn't right, they're always laying their data buses in like a sequential ordering of 0 to 7, 7 to 0. Even today, the latest Infineon 66s claims all this address bus scrambling. That's great, but I'm not going to sit out there on the ROM. I'm going to go right to the heart, the core. And it's right in series again, in uh, sequential ordering again. Some people never learn. I, you know, um, Thompson, same thing. Anybody use ST Thompson products? You, you, yes or no? I didn't see any hands. Yeah. ST. ST. 
Yeah, so the, like the whole smart card 19 series line is on microcode. Infineon 66 runs on microcode. These are no-nos for today because these point me right to the instruction latches of these archi architectures. 220 nanometer, 180 nanometer. They can't be any smaller than 150 or they'd be copper. And they're not copper processes or they turn gangrene a day later. So these chips are, are getting smaller, but they're still running on old school techniques. They've got the room to lay pure lo a pure logic implementation like an AVR has. ML AVR has no microcode or PLA in it whatsoever. Freescale likes to do it, um, Thompson, ST, um, a lot of them. They're, they're a hacker's dream, you know, to, to, uh, to, to, go, to go backwards through the maze, kind of. So, well, so I'll, I need about two minutes to set up. I think it'd be great if you guys want to, like, come up and, and hang out. I think if you, you know, maybe that's easier. I'll t try to talk into the mic, and we'll build the log. In fact, if you guys want, one of you guys can hit the key for me to, like, take the samples. Um, and, you, and then when we're done, you guys can try to put the needle down, <laughs> which is very hard. So, so basically, this is a used Carl Seuss PH150 micropositioner. These things are about $6,000 new. You can get them for under $1,000 used on the surplus market. When you get them used, they don't come with the little arms, the nice little arms that, that I'll show you a picture on the screen. Um, So basically, it's hard to see, so I'll show you here. Um, that's a probe needle right there. You can see the little needle. It's going into an Atmel AVR. This was used in some type of pirate device or something back when, back when I was with uh, my old employer. Uh, you know, get the code out of anything, one needle can get it out. So with one needle, I can turn off a lock bit on a lock microcontroller. Um, and it's funny because I build these libraries of, of chips um, that I've whacked. Um, Thompson 19, five needles, the code's out. I've got it down to four needles now. So you can see, like, you can see I've got, like, um, one, two, three, four, five micropositioners laid around the table, laid around this die. This little wire that you see going over here, it's, it's, it's going to a different board. I build these little boards out of CD carriers and then um, <laughs> Radio Shack parts. <laughs> and then you can see there's a smart card slot that I put a hole in. Um, I, I don't know if everybody can see it, but I, I wish I, I, I tried to get a camera hooked up here, but I, I couldn't do it. Um, so there's a little hole there. The smart card goes in. And if the smart card's been opened, um, one of these is opened. You'll see it through the hole, and the needle can can touch it. Um, we're going to work with one that I've that I've rebonded down. So I've actually thrown it completely into acid. Uh, actually, here's a smart card. So it's a whole other. It'd be a whole day to, to show you guys like opening these chips and stuff. Uh, the best thing would be to see the wired video. Um, so this, I mean, we I'll just pass it around. Um, they probably never come back. That's fine. <laughs> I actually get, got a bunch of swag to give away later. So, um, but um, this is what an open smart card looks like. Um, it's still alive. All the bond wires are attached to it. Um, I, I'll use. I'll typically use like another smart card and kind of take an exacto knife and just chop out. <laughs> chop out. Chop out the module. It kind of clean up the area where it lived, and I'll tape it back into place with some scotch tape to make sure I don't obviously uh, um, isolate you know any of the conductor uh, the contacts that I need like ground VCC and so forth. Um, so these are actually really handy to be a carrier as well. And there's only a few different module types of where they sit um, in their positioning to to make the the contact when it when it's slid in. But a, a smart card again, it's just it's just a, it's a microcontroller that's been upgraded as you know meshing is added to it, things like this today. Um, but it basically, the fundamental of it was some type of off-the-shelf chip before. Um, the needles, you can't really see them, but I'll pass this one around too. Um, just that if you touch the end, you'll damage the tip, and the tip is shaved to a very uh, it's under a mic. It's, don't quote me on this. I think it's under 0.10 microns. They shave it with a mechanical, um, chemical mechanical process. And so there's a little cat whisker at the end of this. Some people choose to buy um, to buy Pico Probe, like Model 12C. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's the, basically it's an active um, buffered, um, like a needle uh, holder tip 
to, to hold the needle on, and you have to buy their $30 needles, and it's very expensive. These, these needles are $5 each, and then I believe in making my own buffers with the lowest capacitance possible, and I succeed up to about 40 megahertz, which no smart card has ever gotten to today. Um, and if it did, I can slow it down by finding the ring oscillator and just jamming a new signal into it. You know? so, and if I, if I, Thompson 19, good example. They left a big, fat test pad right on the ring oscillator. So if I insert, if I inject, my little FPGA board here can, can uh, do 24 megahertz down to, divide it down to 3, 1.5 if you wanted to. Um, typically, I run 3 megahertz. So I just, on the 19 series, I used to inject a 3 megahertz signal into the oscillator. It would slow it down to about 150 kilohertz. And the, the sensors and everything are all like based off of this. So all this low frequency, high frequency detection, it just went out the window. So I'm literally single stepping this processor with the mesh, it's got a mesh over it and such. And, and it, was the, it was not in the wired video, um, but I'd be glad to show you pictures of the, break, of the breaches in the mesh if you want to see them. Um, so this is a needle, um, I'll pass it around. Um, just don't touch the tip, but maybe look at it in that light and change the angle. And you'll see there's a little whisker at the end of it, just like in, in the picture. Um, what do you guys work with typically? Like what kind of chips? You use that in Oliver, which one? Uh, just the stuff like 80, the, uh, the tiny stuff. The, okay. This is the office shelf. Um, I don't, this is not, most of my pictures are on another, another drive. This, I have like 60 gig in pictures that, you know, some of these pictures are 300, 400 megabytes and things like this. And so I have like all these pictures and not enough space to store them on my laptop drive. <laughs> so I had to like delete some of them and I wanted to, um, I had like MSP430 for Travis Goodspeed's talk and things like this. But um, so here's a uh, Mega 647, anybody use it? No? Um, so this is just an overall of the die. It's got a little dirt on it, but it, honestly, it, you know, it's for, you're not supposed to really be seeing this. It's for me. But, um, it, but it gives me an overall of where things live. So, you, can, you know, this is a three metal layer, 350 nanometer process. Um, I actually don't know where the RAM is. It's buried in here somewhere. You'd have to strip off top metal to see bit more underneath because the wires are hiding things. Um, but here's the flash. And then here's the E-square. And then the fuses should be over here on this particular one. Um, I think actually here. So what, then what I did after I found them is I make a little nice little photo like this. And basically, it, there's the fuses. They were on the edge. It's just there's so many varieties of where they live on AVRs, it's tough. And so you put down two needles on these two wires. They're highlighted in red. You hold them low, and you read the chip back out like it was never locked. And then you wonder why your code got stolen or, you know, or whatever happened to it. You know, people hijack everybody's IP all the time, and <coughs> unfortunately, it, um, it's it's hard to protect against it. What's the FPGA board for? So this FPGA board used to be a um, custom microcontroller design board that I did uh, when I was in NDS. It's actually the first PGA board I ever made, um, and it has a lot of flaws on it. Believe it or not, it's just like. Eight, eight, eight layers, nine layers, something like this. But it was our first BGA-based design. And so we didn't bring enough test pads out, and there's a bunch of patches. And then, uh, then you know, USB serial came out, and so I tied it into a FTDI uh, 232. Hi, Steve. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a lot of cuts drilling to this to, to fix uh, shorts. So, but um, we got our act together, and we did another, a new version of this board. And the new version of the board, I just can't get the instruction set agreed on, and I call it uh, the WASP. And I don't remember what it stood for because I did it in 2005. But it has 16 <laughs> meg of 16 megabyte megabytes by eight of uh, static RAM, and then it has eight. Actually, here, I think I have uh, an image of the. Of the, no, maybe I don't have the set. Anyway, it ha, um, I actually have the, the I have it in the, my room. But so it, it has uh, eight individual uh, air, um, like eight needles could come into it uh, or drive things like this. Um, it can voltage adjust from 1.65 volts up to 5.5 uh, digitally through a digital potentiometer uh, designed with individual uh, regulators. Um, there's actually nine of them, but eight of them are meant for needles. So there's like little five. There's eight five-pin header rows um, because. I basically need, um, I need, I need, I need five. I need five wires on my little homemade drivers that I make. I need, I need VCC ground. I need the sense. I always want to sense what I'm seeing on, on the needle. I, and I need um, 
do the dr overdrive or high Z? Which do I want? Do I want to listen or do I want to actually make a change? And then if I do make a change, what's the value going to be? That's yellow. So yellow is what's the value. Green is hit it or don't hit it type thing. And orange is always returning the value. Um, so that this is basically the, the original design and it, that I tried a long time ago. And this works up to about 12 megahertz. But after that, uh, I have a better one than this. That's a Philips 126 with only two drivers. And it's good down to 1.65 volts. And it's, uh, it's what I'm normally using, but I didn't want to take this apart. And it, it just, I figured leave, leave good, good. So anybody else have questions? I didn't finish the FPJ though, actually. I tried something like this. Well, the FPGA, okay, I'll get the code out, let's say. Um, it's just going to be a, you know, a bit stream, and I can clone you like this, but you're trying like a Vertex 4, Vertex 5 type thing? Something uh, smaller, like the lighter weight ones. Like, uh, how about an Altera Max 7000 series? <coughs> yeah, so let's say you were running a cool runner, or you're running um, a Xilinx. I ha I, I've hit them. I, I've hit a lot of this stuff. When I say hit, I mean I've analyzed it and I've studied it and just kind of got an idea. But the attacker, if he does get your code out, it's pretty expensive probably. And when he's done, it, um, he won't know what you did. He'll just know how to copy it, you know, and write the same bitstream in. Um, so you take like an Altera um, 7064. Maybe my next class should just be like showing you guys pictures the whole time, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But um, so Altera 1996 die. These guys really had their act together. Does anybody work for Altera? No. Well, if anybody knows anybody in Altera, this is really nice because this is 1996. They had some good techniques, and they it, get, it got better and better. And of course, today they're 65 nanometer FPGAs. Um, so it took me like three weeks to find what you're seeing in five minutes. Um, they, ha they have test pads laying around the die. So these are test pads, like this guy and this guy, this guy, this guy. The designers thought they might need to, t you know, to come back later and look at it. And so they lay these big, fat, huge pads that I can come down and touch with a, with a needle very easily. Touching this pad compared to touching this wire, um, for the average Joe, it's pretty hard. Um, unfortunately, with some practice, you can get it for really quick. But these pads tell an attacker not only, like, you know, it's well, I should rephrase that. These pads make things easy for the attacker, but they also make him say, hey, why did you leave that pad there? There's a reason you left the pad there if you were the designer, so I'm going to find out why. So the first thing he may do is open up every one of these pads, put down a needle and say, locked, what's it look like? So unlocked, what's it look like? Or if, or just read it back and, and drive it, or, or don't, you know, um, drive a zero, drive a one, drive the, con the, um, the inverse of the state, things like this. Um, none of these pads did, did any good. Um, the fuse was actually, <laughs> it was buried under this, like, well, like, here we go again, it's buried under this pseudo mesh. So this is not really, Active, so to say, but it, but it works because what Altera did was they routed every conductor from the left side of, the, of this picture, way like hundreds of micrometers to the left. Uh, um, they routed them completely across the die, and they're all pretty much equal length, covering every one of the logic cells that stores the configuration. So now you to get you know the fuse is in there somewhere. Where is it? It's a single cell of non-volatile double EEPROM, so it can be erased or set. Um, and they claim that it will only get cleared once you do a bulk erase of the chip. It's not always the case, so be careful. Um, you know, sometimes you can start the erase, kill the power, and it erases the lock bit first and then does the bulk erase instead of the other way. So, so you can see, like, this was before I learned how to use Photoshop. So my lines aren't straight. <laughs> Got little dots on it because it's just too hard to keep it straight. And, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. So you pull out the book and dig and you figure out, you know, what shift does and things like this. <laughs> so, but, um... I, they made one mistake on this design. UV set the fuse. So ultraviolet light, after 45 minutes to an hour, set an unlocked part to a locked state. So guess what I did? I opened about 10 of these things and put nail polish masks down all over. Here we go again with the nail polish from the video. Start laying nail polish. Nail polish blocks UV and HF. HF, though, for the record, it will only block it for about 30 to 45 seconds. Then it starts to kind of like, you know, make it like um, moist enough to kind of saturate through and get down. Um, but you're going to rinse in 15. <laughs> okay. So you follow it down to here. It comes from me metal, metal 2. It goes down to metal 1, and then it goes across. And you can barely see what's underneath here. It's, this is not a planarized die, which means they didn't polish it smooth at all on the under layer. So you can see the ripples of where wires are underneath. Like You, um, you can kind of see tracks in these pictures going, going up and down versus across as well. But the, so the, the fuse was buried under here, and a lot of work and effort showed me that this line right here was the magic line to make it unlock itself. Um, 
If you guys use an AVRs and 89 series uh, Atmels, they're very secure against UV light attacks because they actually set their fuse under UV instead of clearing the fuse. We're like a Cypress USB controller. Does anybody use Cypress? The 63, I don't know what they are, but they're like the most popular USB controllers for dongles, uh, dongles security dongles. Um, Aladdin eToken Pro 60, uh, uses a combination of a smart card chip and um, one of those controllers. Um, not sure what you'd find in something like this, but some of these dongles just have that with an E-square. It's very insecure. UV light, nail polish, UV light, boom. You got the code out in five minutes. Um, okay, so let's go do an, some needles. I was going to get into this, but we don't, there's, there's no way in heck we'll ever get into this. I talked about it at Black Hat, if you guys were there, but um, this is a Thompson 16 CF54, and this had a mesh over the top of it. It was a very old school mesh, but again, the principles, that they, they apply today like they did yesterday. So here's the remainder of the mesh after I hit it with HF with a mask, and then here's the data bus right in the middle of the chip. And you, and you can see, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's, it's a one metal layer with poly. And um, this is just like a test, a test hit with a laser. And then there's your eight tracks. And it's either zero to seven or seven to zero. I don't remember which way it went. Um, so here's a, here's a good question. Here's some, here's some microcode. You've got, again, you've got these ROM tables. Let me open it. I've got a different picture here to show you, actually. What um, do you do if the data bus isn't exposed it's on the bottom layer? It's always exposed somewhere. The where is it exposed, or is it routed correctly, or t together is the question. But it's always going to ex be exposed, exposed in coming out of the memory. For example, um, here I'll, I'll go to a newer chip. Um, this is kind of an older device, and if we go to something newer, um, Let's see what we have here. This is what you'll deal with a lot today. This is an active mesh on a 66P. So it's four conductors, you can see them. Basically what this is is like where it comes in and out of the bottom of the chip to check security, it's basically like circuit, it's like four circuits that come in and out of the, an in and an out. The problem with Infineon's design is the in and the out are about not even 50 micrometers away from each other. So to get through this beautiful 220 nanometer substrate to get underneath this, I just need a, a focus on being workstation. And to do four, uh, eight cuts, you know, basically um, open, open the in and the out of each of the four circuits, and then deposit uh, metal across the two to short them together. There's no type, no, no, no chip to date that I've seen has ever had any type of analog meshing uh, um, to, um, to where, where with an anal analog mesh, I'd have to open it, measure, cut it, measure what I'm about to patch around, and then lay a certain resistance in, in metal uh, deposit. Um, I prefer to deposit with tungsten, um, it's, and, um, but some prefer platinum. For, um, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy. I use a focused ion beam workstation. So it's like five nanometer precision uh, ion beam that fires down into, um, onto your chip. I might have some pictures of, what I, of, of when I've been done with it uh, on here. And it can basically mill or it can deposit. You can deposit uh, silicon dioxide, or, you know, like an ox, uh, insulator, or you can deposit metal. And the metal choice would be um, uh, tungsten or platinum. And basically any fib can do either, but they'll tell you at camp what they can, and it's just a temperature change and a, tell, the, tell the system, you know, platinum or tungsten is inside. Um, but then you want to eat holes too. But the fib won't eat through this mesh as nice as wet chemicals will because you'll get uneven etching. You'll get where the fib will, will leave the metal tracks, but all the oxide has been removed. And it's a big problem, and that's the reason that there's actually probably a space between the lines. But wet chemicals is a, is a whole different ballgame. So you can mix wet chemicals from the wired video with, with those techniques with, with the, the fibbing techniques. Um, so maybe I don't know where the data bus was. I think you asked that. It's not always in order, but here we are in the core of a 66P. This thing's still produced today. I mean, it's the it's their flagship 8-bit 8051 processor they're producing. Does anybody here work for Infineon, or did I ask that? Yeah. I asked it. Okay. Does anybody work for any of these major chip companies? Fabulous. What's that? Fabulous. I'll get to you in one second. Okay. okay. So um, Xilinx is the same way. Xilinx is actually a reverse kind of almost like a reverse Polish you know, notation calculator. Altera set their, lock, uh, set their lock bits with UV, you guys clear them. It's bad, bad, bad no-no. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so in your case, all I need to do is mask where the, where the, where the, where the bit stream's been stored in, like, say, uh, say an XC, 
um, 95, da 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 da, you know, CPLD, or a cool runner. A cool runner I haven't spent much time on, but I have some images of them. Um, just, I, I need a reason. And when, when I was in NDS, I didn't care. I had all the time in the world to do this kind of stuff. But now I kind of have to take jobs that a, a companies come to me and said, hey, we want to know how strong is this chip really? Because the vendor always is always going to tell you how strong it, it is, so to speak. And the data sheet's going to tell you, like, obscured busing and all this, like the 66 right here. But this is not obscured. This is, in, this is physically in order. This is ordered from zero to seven. Now, if you can get to this area, good luck, because it, you, you do need a fib. So you need a fib to do the bridge or the mesh, and it needs to remain. You need to then use wet chemicals to open up. And then there's another ground plane over this area. So you've got to kind of fib twice. But once you're through and you've prepped all this, um, you're good to go. It's only running at about 10 megahertz. And if you drop VDD down to under like 3.3 volts versus 5 volts, the chips all tend to slow down a little bit because propagation uh, delays grow um, as the voltage level drops. So let's see. We'll go to Xilinx. And then I better get rolling here. You guys are going <laughs> to miss the parties. <laughs> okay. No? Okay. Well, I, I don't know where the parties are. My wife and I are wondering, so if you guys know, that'd be great. So, where? How do I get in? <laughs> Is it? Okay. So we'll talk to you later. Okay, cool. cool. <laughs> I'll bring the pro station. <laughs> no. um, so, okay. So, I mean, basically, um, I don't know. Anybody work for HP? Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I actually don't have Xilinx with me. I have it with me, but it's in my room. It's on that other drive. Um, I, I ran out of space, as I was saying. So basically, let's go back to the to the task at hand here, and let's get rocking. Yeah, exactly. See, the guy says, let's probe something. We, and we shall. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to focus our whole area in here. I'm going to keep it up on the screen. So you, uh, actually, I can't keep it up on the screen. I'm going to do my best to keep it on the screen. Um, so here's what we're looking at. This is all we care about on this chip. We care about this area. I'm going to rotate it. This is how it's going to look for us under the microscope. So basically, this is data bus bit zero. This is data bus bit one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We'll, what we'll do first, we'll do a running code. We'll, we'll pull the running code of, of, the, of, the, of each, you know, so we'll sample each of these lines for, say, 32,000 clock samples, see what was on the bus and stuff. You're going to get basically the same log file that I had showed you earlier. Um, then we can look at that. Actually, it'll be a different log file because we're going to go into that non-ISO reset mode instead of normal power-up. Um, so after we do that, I'll show you the location that we're going to squash. I'll show you how... Um, Brooke Hill and I um, timed it earlier up in up in my room, and we'll do the same. We'll basically repeat those steps over again, and then you can kind of be in my world of how I would do it. But but again, this is just kind of proof of concept to you, um, because the it's not that useful um, because it's only 100 uh, 256 bytes, 100 hex. Um, all right. So the FPGA board that was asked about before. It's basically, today, it, it's, I wrote a little, uh, like, a risk processor into it, like, that it's only 8-bit fetches, um, it's, and it's because the way I, I like to write little scripts, it's a pain to kind of stuff 36 or 32 bits across. The new one that I came out with that I can't agree on the instructions set on is very long instruction word, 36-bit fetch, um, using a, a synchronous statogram. Um, the, but again, the problem is I don't like the way, like, here I, I say, like, you know, I set, I can say, like, you know, on one line, buff, I plus, you know, I'm filling a buffer and then I just ship it down to the board and then the board begins executing um, at 24 megahertz each line, so to speak, and, and doing certain things. I can tell it what clock cycle, I can tell it, you know, divide the clock by whatever our, our clock is here, 24 megahertz, divide it by eight, that's typically what I do do, run the smart card nice and slow, they all accept three megahertz. Um, if it's running on its own internal clock, that really doesn't do anything for me except to, to talk to it. Uh, that's the only thing. I'm going to have to pluck their clock out. I can tell the board, though, give them a clock, but take their clock from a needle and feed, and you run on that clock instead. And so externally clocks, basically. I can also tell it which edge to, to clock the data in on, positive or negative edge of that clock signal coming in. Um, I had thought to try to run it through a PLL, but then I realized some of these board, uh, some of these chips, like the Infineon 66, they run an, an asymmetric um, uh, clock cycle. So it's like 100 nanoseconds and 200 nanoseconds, hypothetically. It's not uh, 100 and 100 in a nice square wave. So a PLL goes crazy and doesn't come out with the, you know, the right multiplied frequency. Um, so we can also tell it 
if it is running on our clock, such as the chip will work on, um, we can tell it, I want to be on, for example, I can, I can oversample if I want to, but there's no reason to. So we're just going to take one sample per clock cycle. There's no reason to take two per clock cycle because I only have, I think, on the inside the Xilinx, 256,000 by two bits wide of memory space. It's an 812 EM extended memory. Um, so we can tell it, take a sample and where in that window we want it to be in an eighth. So we can tell it, walk into the, walk into the, when the clock fires, wait two eighths and then sample, or wait one eighth and then sample, or wait eight eighths, but I don't know why you'd wait that long. <laughs> you know, that's not, honestly not going to work, but so it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty wild what you can do with the board. Um, and I'm always adding things to it. So now what I've done is I froze the design. It's frozen. It was done in Leonardo Spectrum and Verilog, and it's just, I write in precision synthesis in Verilog now instead, so it's, I don't even want to mess with the design to convert it or anything. I just want to leave it frozen and just get the new one working. But it's, too, it's a lot. It's a lot of time. So, does anybody read my blog, the FlyLogic blog? Yeah. Yeah. Karsten Knoll is going to start writing for it for me to help me out. I have no time to, to write, guys. I have a 4004 that I need to post, um, the Intel 4004 from MIT. MIT told me that it's the highest resolution pictures they've ever seen of the 4004. It's uh, 1971, November, I think it came out. And um, that's the thing, the net masks back then, or the mask set, um, the quality that the image looks like is, is ancient, you know. So the optical resolution at 200 mag that I did on it is just phenomenal. It really lights up. And there's poly layer and there's the metal layer. I think it's an NMOS or it might be PMOS. I forget. Um, it's fun, though, to trace out the circuitry. Um, so that will get posted soon. Um, I, and I'm always answering emails. It just the blog is kind of, it's the last thing I can do, you know. <laughs> that means I'm busy. <laughs> so, so this script is like basically, you know, turn off the overdriver. If we are going to run the overdrive, I can do, I have two, two overdrive circuits here versus eight on the new one. So let's just drop talking about the new one, then we'll focus on this one. So we have, we have two overdrivers that we can do. We only have one needle right now, though. I have a second, but it doesn't want to stay down. So we're going to work with one. We have limited space on this little thing, and it's really flimsy, and it's, it's going to be a challenge to put the needle down because everything's moving, and this is fi the base is fixed, and normally the base, you can move the base. Normally, I'll kind of nudge a needle into position. I'll get it right around it and I'll kind of nudge a little bit on the base with the with the micro positioner and kind of just and it goes in and um, here we can't so we're it's going to be a challenge but I, I've done it and you guys are going to do it um, so we'll be glitching low when we do finally glitch this is some stuff uh, I have a FIFO in here that can receive data and store and just hold it in a FIFO or I can I can block read the bytes in to stay in a, in a, in a precise sync timing if I need to the board can um, can if you were randomizing your software and I don't feel like figuring out where the call was or how it works or I can't destroy the call what I can do is I can take a sample and then I can take two needles and I can bring them both in and I can say I want you to sample up to 64 bits don't like a logic analyzer basically don't start sampling until until the 64th transition, of the, what I, the pattern I just gave you comes in, and so now your randomizer just went down the tubes, um, because you're eventually going to. I'm going to pick a, a location that is out p after it, and so you know it's going to. My board's going to wait until it sees the, a pattern, and its depth is up to 64 bits. Um, so basically. It's just, they're just little commands that we write, little nano commands. Um, you know, do this, do that. I make the IO pull up, turn on the receiver FIFO, um, do a delay, fire the, and then this is the kicker right here. It's going to be to fire the overdrive line to basically drive that zero. So earlier, before we let the chip come out of reset, we told it to, we prepared it to say drive a low. So this instruction put a low on our little yellow line that I talked about earlier. So we're ready to drive, and when we do drive, it'll be a low signal, a low pulse. Sometimes you do do multiple glitches, though. So, I mean, I didn't have to do that. It's just convenient to, to kind of lay it in up in the front. Um, so basically, we're going to fire the overdrive. We're going to leave the overdrive on momentarily for about 10 clock cycles. This, del this is a 24-bit delay that I wrote into the logic. So it's, you s it sees this, this little command, and then it, it takes three values, three operand values. It's another reason why 36 bits is, uh, would make it a better... Um, a better execution than fetching four bytes or three bytes. Um, so we do, we hold the overdrive on after a specific count, uh, cycle count, clock, uh, clock cycle count. We hold it on and we do this small 24, uh, you know, so that's 10 times 24 megahertz, whatever the reciprocal is of it, um, in timing. Um, 
the delay, um, well, basically, so we're going to momentarily overdrive that signal down to ground, which is going to squash the decrement jump of not zero of R3. But what it's going to squash is um, the one coming out on the bus to become a zero. And so basically what this instruction says in logic is decrement the value. If it's not zero, stay in the loop, uh, branch relative. Um, so we don't want to kill anything else. We just want to kill that one coming out. And we, but we remember the one coming out forced as a zero means it goes into the LU as a zero as a zero now. It then under underflows and becomes an FF because there's only eight bits. Um, if we're too long, it would become like FE. It would come out as an FE because we'd still be driving low. So we're only going to drive for ten times the reciprocal of 24 megahertz, uh, whatever that is for nanoseconds. Um, it's going to be like 60, maybe 60 nanos? What's 50 is 20? You guys can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I use a calculator too much. Um, so we, we turn it off, and then we just kind of wait some time, because now we need, we need to wait time to let, the, to let the UART fetch the remainder of these bytes that are going to come in. So one glitch will destroy this loop, and the loop will, re it will remain in the loop for another 255 clock uh, re re repetitions. And then this just says turn off the, the little sniffers that are sam sampling on whatever I had previously told it to sample. So there's a whole bunch of parallel blocks of logic in here that are doing different tasks. Um, and, and that's about it. But that's only one part of this program. But I, I have to take the mag off because I can't see. Um, so I have to undo what Brooke and I did in the room earlier or it's going to just glitch the card right away when we want to actually just sample the card at first. So I'm going to comment comment it out for us. I'm going to put the, put the mic down, though, guys. So, ba so basically, we want to get... We, honestly, you know what? I'm going, to I'm going to comment more than this out. A bunch of this is basically... We just basically want to power up the chip and let it, and let it run and just listen. Okay, one more second. This should be good. Um, so basically, when when this flow of code hits this b sniff off statement, it'll turn off sniff it, the sniffer to because if it sniffs too much, it's going to wrap around and it's going to overwrite samples I originally took in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll delay some sam some clock period of time. It's something some value I pick. I think it's like one a hex cycle, one a thousand hex cycles will delay. Um, and that's just enough to get the entire reset out of the chip. Um, okay. I, I do, I do. Yeah, but the pump's starting to seize up on me today, so can everybody hear me off the mic? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so the pump started to seize up on me today, so I'm going to actually, don't laugh at this, but this is why we're working on such a big chip, too, because you guys can put the needles down, and the pump's going out. It's the one thing that I should have brought two of that I didn't. It's the only thing I didn't bring two of. And since the pump's going out, I'm going to electrical tape the positioner in place after it's vacuumed down. I mean, this is just crazy. You, you know, you shouldn't be able to do this, but you can, you know. And so because we can, you guys can play, too. So that's, that's the whole point here. So I actually have to change the needle too. Is that needle good? Did you guys touch it? <laughs> no, I mean I can use it still if it's if, if it didn't get bent. If it's it's either bent or it's not. You know? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, I, I sometimes I burn through these things so fast, and I'm like five dollars, five dollars, five dollars. <laughs> so. Well, that's the thing. If, if it's the Pico, Pro, I have Pico Pro 12 Cs, and um, I have a ton of needles for them and stuff, and and they're they're good. But you have to you have to adjust capacitance. You're loading on them and stuff, and it's unique per per device typically, and um, and the needles are too expensive. I mean, they really are. It's, I think I don't know what they are now, but they these needles used to be like 350. And then when I called and ordered like 100 needles a year ago, she was like, it's been like four years since they've been, you know, 350. And I was like, well, I need to be making needles and not be making this, you know, cracking chips, <laughs> you know. Okay, 
So, so we're going to work on this chip. This is that. This is the Silink chip. Wherever they went. So this chip is in here. Um, and if we take a razor blade, which we could, but it's buried under there, and we we cut out this area, you could actually see it underneath the uh, you know the card without popping the module out, or you just pop the module out, whatever. So basically, I throw it into into fuming nitric, uh, let it be completely etched. Um, I'm afraid to pass it around because it's got five little bond wires that if they get broken off, we won't, we won't be able to play. Um, but you'll see it when you look at it through the microscope and projective. Um, so I'm going I'm to try to kind of set this up, and if anybody has questions, please ask. <laughs> this whole station is basically a Velcro setup. This is something Bunny, Bunny Wang and I built for Torcon 9 last year. Um, if you guys ever go to Torcon, we'll probably do something like this again. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, everybody can get some time to play and have the whole day to do it. Um, That's a, we actually did uh, we did a two-part lecture kind of in hands-on on the Infineon SLE 4442, which is um, Kinko's. Anybody know the Kinko's? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's that processor. That's actually not why we did it, though. We did it just because it was a fun uh, old chip that I didn't care about, and I thought it would be a good experience. And it was fun. It was actually a lot of fun. Um, so this year, we'll do something better, maybe more logic you know, and stuff. So Bunny went over principles for like first principles, and then we got into second principles, which is more the way I work. I rarely study logic unless I have to. But if I have to, that's not a problem. It just takes me time. I don't live in you know, a world of poly and the metal and, and, and what dopings are they. But it's not that hard to figure out where the PFETs are and where the NFETs are. And when you do figure it out, the, that whole row is going to be P's and that whole row is going to be N's. Um, Did you ever do any work with SLEs for Formula Yeah, sure. You want to see it? I have it on here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've torn everything apart. And it's, you know, I mean, just to see what is it, how it, you know, is it really that secure? And um, the chance to play with the, uh, any of the cadmium networks chips? Never seen them, no. But it's more, more larger scale than what I would mess with. The SLE 4428? 4448. Oh, no. What is it? What is it exactly? It's, uh, it's a coder. It's 4442 uh, it's a base or something? Because the 40 uh, no, it's, it's, the, it's different. Because it's, uh, this is a 4428. Uh, telephone cards. Oh, I've seen it. I, I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah, and I've also seen uh, the ST. It's, it's also used a lot on laundromat cards. So it's basically the same family member as this one. I, I thought you said the 28, which is what this is. So this is a, a, a 28. And the 28, I, I couldn't get the whole thing to stitch. Stitching these chips when it's repetitive memory areas and things like this, it's hard because there are always many, many pictures wide. This is another old chip, though, from them and stuff. And But this is a... Um, See, that's not the part number, what I'm highlighting with the mouse. It, the M1265, blah, 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 that's really a 4428. That's what it is. So you have to build a library up. 4442 is maybe close to what you're talking about? 4442 was the one with FedEx keyboard. Yes. And then now they have a 55 series. I've seen that one. Have you, have you seen the... No? I don't know. What the, I'll have to look this up. I'll, I'll take a look at it. But it's, it's going to be something like this. If it's a 44 series, it's this era of a technology. I believe this was NMOS, but it may have been PMOS. And, and again, look at all these test pads. Here, it's secure. This is some secure memory. If, if, they, if they can't inject, if they can't be between, if the, between the machine and the card when the password's sent, they won't guess the password because you have, you have I think, three tries. But what if I sit on the data bus? Guess what I see? I see the password come right out. You brought up a good point, too. I can show you the uh, F4442 run, uh, I think. No, I can't. I thought I could. But you have to sniff the traffic between the card and the machine that reads the card, right? Yes. Or can you simulate, simulate that in the lab? Mm, I can simulate it in my lab because I know where the logic is, the mux that throws the mux up. Did you supply the PSC or not? The PSC is the pin code or something. That they, they call it PSC in the 4442, the, 40, uh, the 55, 50, 5542. Um, but really not much changed. Um, here, the 50... What's that? I know. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> okay. Um, like 5542. I, 
like here's the busing too, like zero, two, four, six. And then there it is again. I'm, I'm like leaving little comments about the bus. And you can see there the plugs. This is a very old chip, but these chips are great to learn on. And this duck actually controls if it, if it lets you read back the password or not. If you, so, I mean, it's so weird. The duck's pointing at the secrets. You know? So, like, like this te if, you, if you take this test pad and you drive it low, I, it's, it's either this test pad or this test pad. And you can see it. If you know the PSC and you, you write it in, you'll watch the, that line on, on one of those two signals. The line goes low when it's finally been given valid. So if that line is low, you can, it lets you read out the PSC. If the line is high, it throws a mux. And the mux says set a zero instead. Um, is so it encrypted though? Or? Well, no, no, it's not encrypted. And you just like Strom Carlson did. You just sniff the you sniff the traffic, and you know the average Joe just sniffs the traffic, and, and he um, he knows the password. Um, so now Kinko's the company that makes Kinko smart cards randomizes the password and has like a few bytes that can tell it how to generate what the password is. So they run it through some type of hash or something, and, and the result is what the password would be. Um, so now you got to steal the machine. <laughs> You know, but um, like this is their latest stuff, and and if you read about this, they're telling they're telling you stuff like highly secure 1.2 micron, you know, CMOS process, and I'm thinking 1.2 micron. That's 1,200 nanometer process now. It's you went up instead of down. <laughs> you know, but um, but it, I mean honestly, I I talk about these chips and I make jokes about them. I, I love to work on Infineon, Thompson, um, Dallas, Maxim, Microchip. Atmel AVRs. I, I love all these chips, I, and I mean, it's the reason I have all the libraries of them. The ones I can't stand are like Renaissance, all these weird architectural ones that are large, and I don't know. I just get more more thrill from these guys. Scilabs. Yeah. Scilabs. Uh, it's a TSMC production. I forgot to. That's the one of the, the other brand I was thinking to mention earlier. Um, which Scilabs? The one in Texas. No, no, no. Which Scilabs chip? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so Scilabs, I, I thought I had, see, this is my bad image directory. It's not up to date because I ran out of space. But Scilabs, I have uh, I have a whole ton of Scilabs parts done. It's the same thing. It's basically do a bulky race, tell it you bulky raced it, but don't, but don't, don't let the bulky race happen and that re the register lock bits get cleared because they assume it happened when it really didn't and you read memory out. Or you can do an address bus attack. We talked about that earlier. That's another reason that I didn't think of to do an address bus attack. You know they fetch from the very last address in memory. They read that byte out, and then bits of that byte represent I'm locked or I'm unlocked, etc. It's a bad way to implement security. Um, because we, A, I know how to make that flash return FFs. So if you're doing a password where, oh, it's a 32-byte password, you know, um, I don't even know how many bits it is that would be. But, you know, they give you these large bit numbers, and they tell you this and that. Eight-byte password on uh, Freescale, JB8, JB16, JB12. That's great. So I short this one track down to ground, and I get zeros for the password. Short another track down to ground, I get FFs for the password. And so, I, and you can do your own tests on this because you can take a part that you bought from DigiKey, and you can open it up, and you can load it, and just read from the memory and play around and just induce a fault into the memory and see what's the what's the what's the result. I grounded this line out momentarily or I I or I shorted it or I forced it high. Uh, um, as long as it's not like a direct VCC or ground connection, you're fine. Anything else and you'll probably blow your driver. Um, or you know if it's a BCC or a ground, you'll probably blow your driver out, and you can tell because you won't see any waveforms anymore. Um, <laughs> or you may see like noise, but it won't work. It won't give you any type of toggling like it should. Um, Everything you're saying really begs the question, which is, in your opinion, what, what is the best security? For this? To talk to somebody like myself that <laughs> takes them all apart. <laughs> I mean, no, that's. I mean, that's honestly my business model is to work with, work with uh, you know companies um, to help them make sure What's their products the are strong. You're working with out there? Well, I mean, security is layered. It's not going to come overnight. And so Infineon learns, um, and that's that's um, that's always going to happen, obviously. You know, but a lot of these companies making the chips are very they're very arrogant, and they believe that that they know what's best, and that's. That's not true, because if it was, then you wouldn't see revisions of the die come out and marked or unmarked, and I wouldn't get into the next one. Or you know, you know, things like this happen. And and so I mean, they don't they design the chip, but they don't really they don't have they know what they did, and they kind of the blinders come on, and and they're not in a black box to reverse engineer it. And it's ironic that you said because when I do do an analysis for some of these big companies, um, I give them I don't tell them what to do. I give them suggestive solutions of what to do, what I would recommend maybe trying to do, but don't tell me what you did. And and then my hope is that you'll then implement your own way of doing things and send it back to me and say, analyze it now. Um, 
and it's, it's difficult for me because they tend to say, we're going to take this and do it over on every chip now. This will become the baseline. And, you know, thanks, FlyLogic. You know, you got 12000 or 15000 or some low amount of money, and we're going to make our whole platform secure now. So the, that part of my business model is kind of broken. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but they're so stingy, they'd, they don't care otherwise. So it's like it's, I'm trying to find that win-win here to, to how, how best to help everybody, you know. And so, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, then they'll come and say sabotage or something, you know. So that that we don't want to do that, and you know. But I mean, uh, I, that's partially the blog too. The blog is like a teaser, but the blog kind of shows them that I'm not Joe Blow off the street. I really do tear your chips apart. I know what they're doing, and I know how to how to unlock these chips and stuff like this. And and I think it, I do believe it's helped. Um, and I mean, today I'm working with uh, a lot of the major companies of microcontrollers. I, um, I, I would love to work with Infineon or ST. These guys, I don't know. They're, I know Infineon knows what I'm doing, you know, because they got scared. <laughs> and I heard through the grapevine that they're very worried. So, but I'm, I'm a, not a bad guy. So, <laughs> okay, let's keep going here. So I got, I've got the chip mounted down here. Um, it's, it's mounted in the socket. Everybody can see it. And if you can't see it, you'll see it shortly because you can come up and look through the eyepiece and stuff. Eyepieces and stuff. I'm very dehydrated. Just FYI. Um, thank you. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's going to get hot. I don't know if it's cool now. You may feel like you're in an air conditioner. <laughs> Give it five minutes. <laughs> so, um, basically, you, you can come up and look through it and, stuff and so forth. Um, that, that's a dev package chip, and uh, what did you use to get to, to like, what tools or machine that you used to do that? I, it, there, there is. There is a machine to do that. Thank you. I removed it. Um, I told you guys we have all night. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. So basically, I use a KNS wire bonder. It's a 4524, uh, and this is basically what the, what the machine looks like. And so you take this machine. You have this little mouse over here, and I I, I run one mil. Most of the guys that do failure analysis and these at this type of a level, because really that's what I'm doing. I'm doing security risk analysis, so it falls into kind of the, the subcategory of failure analysis. Um, it, so. They'll use like a one mil wire. Anything smaller than one mil, like the chip really used, like 0.7, uh, um, is really hard for the average just Joe Blow to, to work with. It breaks a lot, it's very brittle, and the wire's not very strong um, because we need it floating in the air. We don't really have the epoxy shell to hold it in place. And so one mil is, is, is the better um, wire for like the. Um, but how does that wire work? You know, right? a person like us to use. Yeah, so basically the machine has this little needle. It's got the little mouse right here. And the average person is going to leave it in, like, manual Z mode um, and, and not semi-auto. Semi-auto is another mode it can be in where it, you, you know the height and how much force to put down and the time. And you're going to bond 50 of the same package. Um, so, you know, if I was going to do 50 of these, I'd put it in semi-auto, and it kind of helps automate the process. But when I do a onesie twosie or five of them, I leave it in manual Z, and basically I, I manually, the more I push this little black button on the mouse right here, this little black button, um, the more I push it, the lower, the lower this little needle goes down that you can kind of not, you can almost see it, it's a little white thing. Mm -hmm. So that's called the capillary. And so the capillary is a needle that's hollow in the middle. And the, the gold wire comes... You, I think I have another photo that you can see it. Um, you can see the capillary kind of there. Um, uh, so the wire is coming down through here. It, it's got solenoids and such, ultrasonic. Um, solenoids are keeping it uh, t the tension proper. And then it, it goes right through the middle of this little white thing. And, and it uses um, like a uh, high voltage to, to like make the ball. Uh, the little ball, it's a little ball on the bottom of it, so that's why it's called a ball bonder. So there's two types of bonders. There's wedge bonders and ball bonders. Wedge bonders are typically aluminum, and they don't need heat, although they can, they can be heated. And a ball bonder always will be heated, although you don't really need that much heat. I keep it at, I think, 30, 30 degrees Celsius. I may keep it at 50 degrees Celsius because I use, um, I use super glue to keep the chips uh, uh, glued down. Because conductive of epoxy, I have to bake it. It's a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. um, just like somebody said, why don't you use photoresist, the, one, the type that will wash away after I've hit it with UV patches for making masks against nail polish, because that works as well to block hydrofluoric and, and, and things. And I said, because I have to cook it. I have to, I, it has to be baked on. It's a pain. It's, it's more easier to just take some nail polish in like a red color, drop the drop, and spread it. Um, 
So anyway, this thing makes a little ball, connects, and then you use the mouse to let you let go of the black button, and you move it over to the landing pad where you want to place it. You press it once more all the way, and then it comes down, and it automatically cuts it and makes a new ball with the uh, the high voltage, and um, the connection is done. The gold is nice, though. It's very convenient because I can drop a ball. I can go A to B to C to D if I needed to. Sometimes on, like, MSP430s, um, I take... Uh, does anybody use an MSP430? So you blow the JTAG fuse um, on a lot of these. I just come over if it's like a 2000 series or a lot of these, um, a lot of the newer die revs from 2005 and on from TI, they're, they, the JTAG fuse is, is, seeable, is, vi is visible from top metal. And the junction that, it, that it, they blew open, that they've created an open on, is actually on top metal. So you, point A needs to get to point B, but it's been severed. So point A is actually that test pin. You know, pin one, for example, on some of these 20-pin SOICs. So I take my, my laser cutter, and I blow a big hole on the B side, and then I come down with this wire bonner, and I just slap a big ball right over that hole that I made, and then I take it right to pin one. And so the JTAG fuse, without even putting a needle down now, has just been repaired permanently forever. So um, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's okay. Mostly you just actually make connections <laughs> internally, right. that's what you're saying? No, 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 in some cases. Well, so, like, let's say you have a big VCC plane for your internal core voltage, and I want it for some reason. And believe it or not, I have in the past, um, for my own, to, to be at the same exact logic level uh, with my drivers. Um, I'll take your v, one of your thick VCC planes, do the same thing. Open a big hole. If it's not big enough, open several big holes. And then, you know, the more metal I expose, the better. Oh, no, we didn't even probe yet. Can we have one more hour? <laughs> <laughs> can we have like 20 minutes? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, crap. Um, is oh. there some... Well, can we take it to the skybox? <laughs> is that, where's... Um, is Joe Grant here? Joe, Joe Grant wanted me to... Uh, or that's even easier. Can everybody help take something? <laughs> um, Joe Grant wanted to bring this up to the skybox, the hardware hacking thing or something. So... Um, yeah. Yeah. Take the table. <laughs> That'd be great if we could just take the table. That'd be actually excellent. Yeah, like hard work. No, 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 no. The screen. Is... Oh, you can we stay here? Um, I don't know if y'all just say thank you and we get big claps, then we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>